I'm Christy McDonald, and join me this week for One Detroit Arts and Culture. We'll take a closer look at the power of art behind bars, a University of Michigan program going 25 years strong, plus a tribute to Ed Love, the voice of jazz in Detroit, then the world of a Detroit fashion illustrator, and a performance from Sphinx alum Anthony McGill, now of the New York Philharmonic. It is all coming up right now on One Detroit Arts and Culture. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation. Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. Ally. The Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation. And viewers like you. Hey, One Detroit, I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm still social distancing at my home, but bringing the arts and culture that we're all missing in person to you right here on the show. Coming up, the story of a fashion illustrator capturing designs quickly and in a vibrant way. Plus a tribute to 60 years of being the voice of jazz in Detroit, an honor for WDET's Ed Love. And then Anthony McGill, principal clarinetist at the New York Philharmonic, says thank you to the Sphinx organization for his start. He'll perform for us. It is all coming up. And we're starting off tonight with an art program that inspires people who are incarcerated to paint. The Prison Creative Arts Project at the University of Michigan has reached its 25th anniversary. And as one Detroit senior producer, Bill Kubota, tells us, one prolific artist is known for his creations, and that's leading people to advocate for his release. Or Welcome, if you're just joining us. We are at the famous Heidelberg Project, the entire block of Heidelberg Street in the city of Detroit, one of the more famous landmarks here. Retired TV reporter Bill Proctor's mission? Freeing innocent people behind bars. He's hosting an online fundraiser for a man locked away in Muskegon. It's the art community in the entire city of Detroit stepping up for a cause today. And that cause is a fellow named Ray Gray. He is a wrongfully convicted man who has been in the Michigan prison system since 1973. We're selling our friend Ray Gray's artworks. We actually have 50 of them. We're working really hard to find $15,000. The money to cover legal costs for a new hearing. Supporters of Ray Gray, now 68, say they've got evidence that would clear him of a murder 47 years ago. Uh, obviously some of Ray's work is still with him in prison, but his wife is lucky enough to have 70, maybe 80 pieces. And we've chosen a few and we're, we're making them available. What's this one now? Blue Madonna. There's the original. A man looking inside himself. The doors represent decisions. Open one door and you go a certain way. Open another, you go another way. And I think he's a really good example of how people can actually teach themselves incredible skills. At the University of Michigan, Nora Kronitsky and Janie Paul are part of the Prison Creative Arts Project, PCAP. Paul was there from the start 25 years ago. For a while we were having a record number of prisoners in general, but that number has gone down. But have you seen the number in, of artists go down? No. Oh, oh no. no. No, no, no. It's way, it's, it's just exponentially increasing because of the show. Mm -hmm. The show? Every year, PCAP curates the best art from 28 Michigan prisons. Thousands come to see. 700 works submitted this time, but this time COVID has stopped the show. In the, in the beginning, the work, there was more work that was what you traditionally call prison art, like tattoo-related images, girly pictures, 
motorcycles, things like that. And then there were a few artists who were doing incredibly unique work that was just uh, idiosyncratic. Here are examples from this year's exhibition in an online preview. Not what some collectors are looking for, so-called murderabilia, ghoulish stuff by the most heinous of criminals. Those are not these. And these, according to the curators in Ann Arbor, are truly fine art. Do these works get sold? Is there a market for it? Absolutely. So that's another really important part of, of the annual exhibition. Um, at the artist's prerogative, all of the artwork is for sale, and the proceeds um, of every sale go back directly to the artists themselves. I think that last year, the cumulatively um, PCAP sold over $25,000 worth of art. I think the total was closer to $27,000. This is the one I was telling you about. Moving them around makes me... Uh... Nervous? <laughs> I think if the DIA curators saw what you're doing here, they wouldn't feel too good. Oh. Barbara Gray first met Ray Gray in the late 70s, part of an arts and prison program even before PCAP came along. I had very little talent, but I did have the ability to teach somewhat. They eventually married. Hello, Ray. They talk every day. Um, You're still negative? Yeah, I got a thing back today that's negative. Fortunately, we don't have capital punishment in Michigan because he'd be dead. But right now he's in Muskegon Correctional Facility that it's almost like a death sentence because it's a hot spot of the prison system. It seems like more people with COVID-19 than without. Gray entered prison at 21, a boxing champ, could have gone pro. When a man he met in passing said to be a drug dealer was shot dead, Gray was ID'd, charged, and convicted. To this day, Gray says he's innocent. So you were painting before you went to prison? Yeah. I uh, was intending to go to art school at that time. I've been involved in art since I was about five years old. Really? Yeah, my father was an artist, and, uh, and my mother. Does art help you as you go about your day? Do you do a lot of it on a given day? Yes, but sort of my religion. It, it helps. It helps greatly. I guess it's called a form of escapism, but I don't look at it in that manner. You know, sometimes I paint things that I don't even fully understand myself. I mean, it's almost like a, a different entity. It's as if something else takes over. It's like a relationship between you and your painting. It helps to keep him sane. At one point he said it was like he was behind glass and he was screaming and nobody could hear him. Now it seems like he's getting through and his paintings kind of speak for him even when he can't. Well, Ray's been in the show for a long time he is highly respected. He's taught a lot of people. His work is really skillful. And I think what makes it exceptional is his sort of incisive critique, like his social critique. There's a painting of Governor Snyder in a bottle that's about the Flint water crisis. There's this fish with a gas mask on. You know, I mean, he's he's really kind of brilliant at these metaphors where he d you don't really have to say anything. You just get, get it, and you feel his conviction behind it. Many of his pieces aren't just portraits. They tell a story, and I think that's another thing that makes him different. What about the Ray Gray story? Will that change? His supporters want to bring evidence never presented showing he couldn't have done the killing. They say they know who really did, although that man has died. How are things going in terms of you getting out of prison? Well, I talked to my attorney yesterday and there's some, some real positive things just beginning to happen. There's some things that are being re-looked at. In the meantime, more paintings wait to be sold for the free Ray Gray legal fund. 
So far, they've raised about 2500 of the $15,000 goal. He honed his talent over many years on the inside. I can only imagine how wonderful his work would be had he had a chance to attend that art school and to flourish on the outside as a free man. Now to a celebration of 60 years as the voice of jazz in Detroit. Just a few weeks ago, Ed Love was honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. His show, Destination Jazz, the Ed Love Program, has been on WDET for 37 years. His love of music and impact across the airwaves is still going. Hi there, Love here. That's the voice of legendary Detroit broadcaster Ed Love, who for 60 years taught so many of us to love and appreciate the world of jazz. Ed was born into a family of music lovers in Parsons, Kansas. He studied the trumpet in junior college and thought for a time he would become a jazz musician. But after he graduated, he chose to attend the Pathfinder Broadcast School in Kansas City, graduating at the top of his class. His first job in broadcasting came in 1952 when Ed joined the United States Air Force and became an Armed Forces radio staffer in the Philippines during the Korean War. After returning home from the war, Love landed his first commercial job at KIND in Kansas, then went on to work at stations in West Virginia, Philadelphia, New York, and Boston. In 1959, he contracted a serious case of pneumonia and moved in with relatives in Detroit to rest and recover. What he found in Detroit was a profusion of jazz clubs where the architects of the Motown sound performed and hung out. And with that, Ed decided to make Detroit his home. In his adopted city, Ed became a musical institution and his deep knowledge of jazz introduced generations of listeners to the genre. For decades, Ed has worked tirelessly to promote Detroit and Detroit jazz talent. Ed Love's beautiful, smooth voice has been heard at R&B stalwart WJLB, classical music station WQRS, and WCHD, later renamed WJZZ. In 1983, he joined Detroit's NPR affiliate WDET-FM and began Destination Jazz, the Ed Love program, a weeknight broadcast that turned into one of the station's most listened to programs. For his many contributions to jazz music and for 60 years as a premier broadcaster in Detroit, the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History recently honored Ed Love. Good evening. My name is Neil Barclay, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Charles H. Wright Museum. Ed Love is a musical institution. His evening radio show, Destination Jazz, the Ed Love Program, has been in place for nearly 40 years on radio station WDET-FM. A musician leader who ignored temporary trends to put listeners in touch with the roots and new manifestations of the jazz tradition, his deep, deliberate, yet companionable voice is familiar not only to Detroiters, but also to national audiences who heard his syndicated national public radio program, The Evolution of Jazz. WDET served as home base for the evolution of jazz, a syndicated program that ran for six years on NPR and was heard on 125 stations around the US at its peak. While here in Detroit, Destination Jazz remained one of WDET's most listened to programs. Well into his sixth decade of radio, Love has been honored by the Motor City Music Foundation, the Southeast Michigan Jazz Association, the Congressional Black Caucus, and the National Broadcast Awards. Today, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, the staff and members of the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, I am honored to have the privilege of bestowing the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Wright to the incomparable Ed Love. Accepting the award on behalf of Ed are his daughters, Angela and Anjanette Love, and Mary Satina, of WDET. Good evening. On behalf of our dad, Ed Love, we graciously accept this well-deserved honor. Thank you. This next story comes from our show on Detroit Public Television called Detroit Performs, and it features the art of Nicole Jarris. 
She's a fashion illustrator that's had to find balance between being playful and precise in her sketches. I think it was really the fashion industry that inspired me to do this. It's all about the clothes for me. Fashion illustration is, it's like a different form of expression than photography. You have a lot of fashion photography out there, but not a lot of fashion illustration. So it's a, just a different expression of um, the figure, a different expression of the wardrobe, the, the way the wardrobe moves. It's different than design. I'm not like designing the clothes. I'm just taking the photo or taking the person and transforming it into something new. Before photography, there was only illustrators um, illustrating these ideas for magazines and then helping designers out as well, illustrating the figure, which was a very important part of like seeing the dress before the design was made. And then, yeah, you had the illustrators who were working for Vogue or WWD. There was a guy named Rene Gru, and he was one of my favorite illustrators, and he, you know, kind of dominated that field. But unfortunately, like once photography came, it was like a quick way to seize the moment and it kind of took over illustration at the time. I think an illustration is more special than a photograph. I know a lot of talented photographers, but it's very like straightforward, this is the image. With an illustration, you're taking an idea and recreating it into something new, something more magical. I really want to express a gesture with my fashion illustrations. It's more mesmerizing, it captures like color and light and movement. That's what really what I want to capture with my illustrations. So sometimes I'll take a photo and I'll stylize it more. Everything is always changed up. It's never exactly the same as a photograph. I focus more on the clothing when I do the illustration. I really like couture gowns. Couture is like a high design, uh, a way of sewing and intricate patterns. I like that it's telling a story in a way. And I just like the whole movement of the couture compared to a street style that you might see. For the mediums that I use, I play around with a lot of different things. I, um, I use colored pencil, ink, watercolor, gouache, acrylic, anything that I can find. I really like to mix it up and try different techniques. The type of clothing definitely makes a big impact on what I use for the medium. If I see a flowy dress, I might want to use watercolor because watercolor is very graceful and elegant. So I combine a lot of digital and traditional methods together, especially when I'm working for uh, a client for a magazine. So I'll start the illustration off traditionally. I'll do like a pencil drawing and I'll do my watercolor and ink. Then I scan it in and I finish it up in Photoshop. And I might like do this several times to get the exact essence of what I'm trying to represent. I worked for a lot of different companies in fashion. I've worked for Roger Vivier. It's like a couture um, shoe company in Paris. I've worked for Elle magazine and Glamour magazine, a lot of fashion magazines. My favorite project that I worked on was for Roger Vivier. I designed a bunch of greeting cards for him um, and his company, and that was a lot of fun. It was like a very luxurious brand to work for, and I'd really like to work for different brands like that. The daily struggle that I have is to be playful and precise at the same time. In my personal pieces, those are always the most fun for me. So I just try to be a little bit more free. I try to be a little bit more fluid in what I'm doing. I think people really respond well to my personal pieces. Um, maybe because I'm not overthinking them as much. Uh, I think that they really like the gesture that I put into my personal pieces and the color and just the overall feeling is just more creating something that's beautiful for someone to put in their home or you know, to, sh to show to their friends and family. I just wanna share my work with people. Interacting with the community here is really important to me. I started seeing illustrators doing these sketching events a few years ago, you know, in bigger cities like New York and Paris, and I thought, 
I really want to bring that to Detroit. I want to do the same thing and nobody else is doing it. So I contacted Neiman Marcus and Saks and they were both on board and they started having me uh, regularly sketching. I bring all of my supplies with me, some paper, and then people just start coming up to my booth and they see me sketching. I usually like take a photo of them or they'll stand in front of me and pose and I'll do my sketch and it's kind of like a takeaway gift for them for the evening. I sketch a little bit of everything. I sketch people dressed to the nines in gowns and then I dress people in streetwear. My favorite is when people are really dressed up. It makes it a lot of fun. I like when people are dressed, you know, bold and with lots of color. It really gives me an opportunity to get out there, talk to people, interact with them, and just, you know, see what they respond to. It helps me to improve upon myself when I see if they react to one sketch compared to another sketch. Well, when I started doing these events, I realized that I had to be very quick. I only have a certain amount of time to sketch somebody. And I realized that I, I don't need to spend, you know, hours and hours and hours on one single illustration. People really like it when it's simple and fluid. And I try to bring that into my work at home to remember to keep it simple, keep it playful, and don't overthink it too much. The community loves it. They're excited about it. I've had a ton of support from people here in Detroit, so it's been really great. I think that the illustration just brings a different outlook on fashion. I think people sometimes respond more to the fashion illustration than if they were to see it in person or even on their computer screen with photography. It just brings more of a special feeling. I don't think fashion illustration ever gets boring. I think it's something that evolves over time. I think my style could change again, like it has in the past. Uh, it just depends on you know, the trends, what's going on, and what I think people are responding to at that time. And for more arts and culture stories, just head to our website at OneDetroitPBS.org. And finally tonight, the Sphinx organization was created back in 1997 as a way to transform lives through the power of diversity in the arts and bringing inclusion to classical music. There are many professional musicians around the world who got their start and opportunity as students from the Sphinx organization. Well, tonight, Anthony McGill, the principal clarinetist of the New York Philharmonic, says thank you to the Sphinx with a special performance from NYC. Enjoy, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.
You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation. Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. Ally. The Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation. And viewers like you.